President, for the immense privilege of speaking here tonight. Now, when I first heard I was speaking in this debate, I asked my dad, what would you think? And he said, obviously, it's better to be feared. So I knew I had to say it was better to be loved. But honestly, why would I choose to take the side of proposition and focus on a 500-year-old statement, which even the founder of Machiavelli did not himself wholeheartedly believe? He said himself that it was better to be both loved and feared. And while he tentatively preferred fear, where both could not coexist, may I remind you that this was said in the context of violence, intense political conflict. Machiavelli experienced fights between Florence, Milan, Venice, Naples, Spain, and the papacy for control over Italy, and witnessed several French invasions of his home nation. His statement was written in a time of violent conflict and blackmail where fear was all that was known. We, on side opposition, are living in the present. Or, in contrast to Hannah, the real world, not the world of fantasies and supervillains. So with that, I will focus on three arguments, with examples relevant to the modern day. Inevitably, I will first introduce the political angle to show that particularly the general population suffers where fear prevails. This will then be applied to alternative forms of leadership before concluding with the addition of the desire for love in our personal relationships. However, before this, it is my immense pleasure to introduce the speakers on the side proposition. You have just heard from Hannah Edwards, librarian of the Oxford Union, and one of my closest friends. Now, it didn't surprise me to hear that Hannah had spoken to go against love because her parents were willing to fork out thousands of pounds just so they, for boarding school just so they didn't have to see her every day. <laughs> Additionally, she mentioned me being asked on a date by Matthew. She didn't mention that Matthew has asked out every single one of his female friends, apart from Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> and he quite proudly attests to that. The second speaker in proposition is Louise Mench, author of Chicklet Novels, a former Conservative MP for Corby, and a reporter on allegations of ties between the Russian Federation and the Trump administration. She started as a Tory, moved to Labour, and then went back to Tories. Usually the impossible task is convincing the other side that you're right, but considering her track record, it shouldn't be that difficult tonight. <laughs> the third speaker is Christine Carroll Chung, visiting student and the union's sponsorship officer. Now, as you will begin to see, the proposition is almost entirely focused on Donald Trump. Um, Christine's email to Eric Trump was received well by him, and he thanked her for her support of the Trump family and her agreed, her agreed disdain for the forces of wokeness. Clearly, she's on the wrong side, as despite being a Democrat, Christine has convinced Eric Trump of her Republican love. Finally, we have Omarasa Newman, American reality TV show participant on the first season of NBC's The Apprentice, and former political aide to, you guessed it, Donald Trump. After being fired from this job, she competed in the reality TV show Big Brother twice. Her road to notoriety and to sitting in the union was just being fired by Trump twice. Mr. President, these are your guests and they are most welcome. The feared versus loved argument was originally forged on the question of what makes a better state ruler. Machiavelli's philosophy was founded with individualistic focus. The aim of such questioning has been to decipher which method secures longer and more authoritative rule. However, in contemporary political theory, good rule means much more. Political rule must only be classified as good when it is an act of public service with the aim of the population's general well-being. Or more simply put, good, good rule as we understand it today is measured against those that are ruled, not those who rule. A population fearful of its ruler can only ever suffer. One only has to look at few examples of authoritarian leaders to see such a pattern. In, Swaz in Swaziland, King Maswati III epitomizes rule by fear. Political parties are banned, the death penalty can be issued for any crime, and he previously gave himself the royal prerogative to ban any newspaper that criticized his reign. His authoritarian regime has caused life expectancy to plummet to 31 years, made 25% of his population dependent on international food aid, and despite the fact that over 25% of his population are HIV positive, he has remarked that those at are should be sterilized and branded. In stark contrast to his people, Maswati possesses countless luxury, luxury properties and expensive cars. 
Maybe there is something to be said for the personal benefit he receives from evoking fear, but it is certain that the general population of Swaziland only suffers to unimaginable extents. A similar story exists in China. Xi Jinping has implemented aggressive censorship laws, removed term limits for his presidency, and has reduced accountability by establishing groups and committees to bypass existing government institutions. Most notably, the power of his authoritarian regime proved almost unlimited through his acts of genocide. In 2020, Adrian Zenz estimated that a total of 1.8 million Uyghur and other Muslim minorities had been extrajudicially detained in what he described as the largest incarceration of an ethno-religious minority since the Holocaust. Um, Ethan Gutman estimated in December 2020 that 5 to 10% of these detainees had died each year. Rule by fear and consequential suffering is similarly witnessed in Russia, Equatorial Guinea, North Korea, to name but just a few. It is no coincidence. Rule by fear is associated with death, poor quality of life, mass suffering. Rule by fear has detrimental effects on populations. All of the worst political systems are based on rule by fear. This is internationally recognized fact. Going back to the very question upon which Machiavelli's philosophy was founded only disproves the proposition's argument. The story of love leading to prosperity is also not limited to the political sphere. It filters down to all levels of leadership. The teachers from school which I have the most love for are my history and politics teachers. Here I am today studying those very two subjects at Oxford because my admiration for them sparked my interest and made me dedicated enough to gain admission here. And God, I definitely wasn't scared of them. I mean, one was a short Irish man and the other my mum described as what looked like a, a sixth form student. So <laughs> a quick look on ratemyteacher.com also tells me that I'm not an anomaly. Fear does not lead to respect. Countless students describe their low ratings and lack of respect for teachers who force them to stay after school to do work or couldn't control the class because they would just shout at them. Football managers are another great example. Jose Mourinho has been labelled possibly the greatest manager in Chelsea's history, winning three league titles, one FA Cup and three League Cups. They could do with someone like him now, but... Pep Guardiola, too, has been dubbed one of the greatest managers of all time since joining City, and at Barca, too, he won 13 trophies, including two Champions League, three La Liga trophies, one Copa del Rey, three Super Copas, two UEFA Super Cups and two FIFA World Cups. These are managers that have only ever been described lovingly by the players that they coach. John Terry asserted that he would leave that pitch in a coffin for Mourinho. Messi thanked Pep publicly with all of his heart for everything he has given him personally and professionally. These are just two representative examples of how the greatest managers are loved, but if they are not enough, you can talk to my stepmom after the debate and she will happily tell you how she'd leave my dad for Pep Guardiola. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, it is only right to include personal relationships. To quote ChatGBT, the expert in love and emotion, love forms the foundation of healthy and fulfilling relationships, creating a sense of belonging, support, and understanding. Now, it's easy for me to discuss love. I'm very fortunate to have the love and support of my family, my friends, and my boyfriend here tonight. But I thought a more fitting anecdote would be to look at the president, Mr. Matthew Dick, who truly has experienced the trials and tribulations of love. <laughs> He fondly reminisces of his days at Eton playing field game, a very confusing sport that's only played there. Um, and he's rather proud of the fact that he has no sporting ability, but he trawled the internet and created a PowerPoint because he was so in love with the sport and so dedicated to it, and he became captain as a result. He also discusses how his dad came every day with orange slices to give the players at half time. But on the fateful day his dad couldn't be there to support and show his love was the first day his team lost. Love got him far in school and this has only continued in his union days. He is not sitting in that chair because people fear him. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> the reason he got elected to committee in the first place is genuinely because someone thought his surname was hilarious. Honestly, he is only sitting in that chair because of a combination of his friend's love and one individual who loved the fact his surname was Dick. Now let's go back to the tribulations of love and personal relationships. Matthew was rejected by women, and I mean a lot of women, <laughs> for 20 years. Me included, Hannah didn't have the chance. <laughs> Until one day he got a girlfriend, and you should have seen his elation. Everyone else was a bit shocked, but... 
He is walking proof that love creates success and happiness. He fell short at love at points, and he was definitely worse off for it. Matthew, despite of his years of romantic love's absence, even yesterday agreed that it is by far better to be loved. Love does not necessitate prosperity, but you sure as hell can't have prosperity without it. After this debate, you will vote based not on fear, but which side and which speeches you prefer. By voting in such a way, you're already choosing love and rejecting fear. And so I urge you all to vote side opposition. Woo!